Santa Claus is supposed to bring joy during the holiday season, but this jolly fat man in red brought nothing but death. Bruce MacArthur targeted gay men living secret lives. Then he buried them in plain sight while masquerading as your friendly neighborhood mall Santa. Welcome to True Crime Recaps. I'm Chris. Thanks for joining us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, remember to subscribe and hit that bell so you never miss a recap. John arrived in Canada between 2012 and 2013. He was a married Middle Eastern man with a secret he held close to his chest. He was gay and nobody could ever find out. Now, John is not his real name. It's how they referred to him in court documents. Now, the only way he could express himself in secret was by meeting strange men on gay hookup apps like Grindr or Bear Forest. John preferred an app called Growler. It's where he met Bruce MacArthur, a landscaper in his mid-60s, a bear who was into BDSM, drugs, and rough sex. They'd been talking for a while and had met for sex several times. Their relationship was meant to be secret. Little did John know someone was watching. On January 18th, 2018, John arrives at Bruce's apartment for sex. He lets Bruce handcuff him to the bed. Bruce said he wanted to try something different. Then, Bruce tapes his mouth shut and puts a black bag over his head. But just before things get going, there's a rat-a-tat-tat on the door. Police, open up. Bruce opens the door and police storm in. They free John, who may not have known how much danger he was in. He's just been bound, blinded, and gagged by one of Canada's most prolific serial killers. Police have been following Bruce for weeks. He's the primary suspect in a near-decade-long investigation into missing and murdered gay men in Toronto, Ontario. They've covertly combed through his computer and found pictures of the victims, though they still need more evidence to arrest arrest him. But the police tailing Bruce have strict orders. If you see him alone with someone, bag him. Those officers watched John walk inside Bruce's apartment that day. He's lucky they were there. But how did Bruce get away with it for so long? How did this charismatic landscaper who played Santa Claus at Christmas hide the fact that he's a cold-blooded killer? Bruce MacArthur grew up in 1950s Ontario, Canada. He lived with his sister and parents in the small farming community of Woodville. The family was well-known and well-liked. His parents ran a mini foster care center out of their home. It's where Toronto parents would send their troubled youth to escape the pitfalls of city life. At times, his parents fostered as many as 10 kids at once. But by all accounts, it was a stable environment. The kids never complained, and most enjoyed their time with the MacArthurs. The only arguments were over religion. Bruce's mother was a strict Irish Catholic. His father was a Scottish Presbyterian. And while they bickered over the nuances of each other's faith, there was one thing they always agreed on. Homosexuality was a sin. The rest of Canada agreed with them, as same-sex adults sexual behavior wasn't decriminalized in Canada until 1969, when Bruce was 18. Bruce was gay. His sexuality was his deepest, darkest secret. He married a woman, his high school sweetheart, in 1973. He got a job working in a department store in downtown Toronto. It was a few blocks south of Church and Wellesley, an up-and-coming gayborhood. But Bruce did what he could to repress his sexual urges. He was active in his church. He had two children. He began working as a traveling sock salesman. His mother died in 1978. His father passed three years later. Bruce fought his feelings up until the 90s. Then, he began venturing into church in Wellesley and having affairs with the men he met at bars. He finally came out to his wife, but they continued living together for the children. They didn't formally separate until 1997, at which point Bruce rented an apartment closer to the gay scene. Things turned violent on Halloween 2001. Bruce had recently turned 50 and was walking with a man named Mark. Mark invited Bruce up to his apartment to see his Halloween costume. As they entered the building, Bruce bludgeoned Mark Mark with an iron pipe. According to reports, Bruce had a habit of carrying this pipe wherever he went. Mark fought back but eventually lost consciousness. He was covered in his own blood when he woke up. He called 911 and was treated for head and body trauma. Meanwhile, Bruce turned himself in after the attack. He claimed not to remember the assault or why he hit Mark in the first place. He pleaded guilty to assault charges but avoided jail time. Instead, Bruce spent 12 months under house arrest. 
He had to abide by a strict curfew for the next six months and was on probation until 2004. He wasn't allowed anywhere near church in Wellesley unless it was for work or medical appointments. Bruce avoided hard jail time partly because a psychiatrist determined he was at a very minimal risk of reoffending. The report said Bruce showed absolutely no signs of psychopathy. Remember, this was after he beat a man with a metal pipe for no reason. The internet boom of the late 90s and the early 2000s was very kind to Bruce. He signed up for every gay dating app and website he could find and developed a taste for young South Asian and Middle Eastern men. He moved into a 19th floor apartment at Leeside Towers in Thorncliff Park, a neighborhood in Toronto with a heavy immigrant population. It was also three miles northeast of Church and Wellesley. The courts may have banned him from visiting the neighborhood, but that wasn't about to stop Bruce MacArthur. At the same time, Bruce was getting his landscaping business off the ground. He worked under the company name Artistic Designs. He usually had a young South Asian or Middle Eastern helper with him. Most of his clients were wealthy white women who described Bruce as charming, kind, and cheerful. During the off-season, he'd play Santa at the mall. With his rosy cheeks, heavy build, and snowy white hair, he was the picture-perfect Saint Nick. Parents had no idea their kids were sitting on the lap of a soon-to-be serial killer, telling him what they wanted for Christmas. On September 6, 2010, 40-year-old Skandaraj, Skanda Navaratnam, was seen leaving zippers, a former former gay bar with an unknown man. Friends who saw Skanda the day before say he was excited about his new dog, but for some reason he left the dog behind at the bar that night. Nobody ever saw him again. Skanda was a refugee from Sri Lanka with no family in Canada. He'd been romantically involved with Bruce after they met in 1999 and even worked for his landscaping company until 2008. In November 2012, Toronto police launched Project Houston to investigate Skanda's disappearance and alleged murder. Until then, there'd been no other leads in his case. Then, someone posted on a cannibal forum called Zambian Meat, claiming to have killed and eaten a man in Toronto. The investigation uncovered two more men, 42-year-old Basir Fazi and 58-year-old Hamid Kahan, who went missing around the same time. Both men were Afghan immigrants doing everything they could to hide their double lives. Police finally interviewed Bruce in November 2013 after getting tips that he knew both Hamid and Skanda. Bruce admitted to knowing both men from the bar scene, but that was it. Project Houston went up in flames. There was nothing to prove what happened to these men. On August 14th, 2015, 50-year-old Sarush Mahmoudi was last seen near his home in Toronto. He was an Iranian refugee with no family in Canada. That is, until he met his wife. But like the other missing men, Sarush had to keep his sexual identity under wraps. They later learned that before his marriage, he was in a four-year relationship with a transgender woman he met in church in Wellesley. The first break in the case was when 49-year-old Andrew Kinsman was last seen on June 26, 2017. It was the day after Andrew attended Pride Toronto. His friends hadn't heard from him, so they entered his apartment two days later. His 17-year-old cat, which Andrew loved more than anything, had been left without food and water. His medication was still in the cabinet, but there was no sign of a disturbance. Unlike the other men, Andrew was openly gay and had deep roots in his community. His friends called him stable and responsible. He wouldn't just leave, especially without his cat and meds. He was also active on social media, but his phone had been off since the 26th. Toronto police launched Project Prism in July 2017. They were now digging into Andrew's disappearance, along with another Turkish man named Salim Essen, who vanished in March. They were also blowing the dust off Project Houston's failed cases. These missing men had too much in common. There had to be a connection. People in church in Wellesley feared they had a serial killer on their hands. The police said otherwise. They didn't have the evidence to make such claims. While investigating Andrew's case, police found the name Bruce written on his calendar on June 26, 2017, the day he went missing. Cameras outside Andrew's apartment showed him getting into a red 2004 Dodge Caravan. Unfortunately, the camera couldn't see the driver or the license plate. At the time, there were 6,000 similar cars registered in Toronto, but only five were registered to someone named Bruce. The only person who owned a 2004 model 
was Bruce MacArthur, but Bruce didn't have the van anymore. They tracked the caravan to an auto shop in Ontario. The owner confirmed he bought the van from Bruce. Then they found trace amounts of blood inside. That blood and other DNA evidence matched Andrew Kinsman and Salim Essen. It allowed police to secure a general warrant to search Bruce's home. They snuck in while Bruce was away and cloned his computer's hard drive. On it, they found post-mortem pictures of Andrew, Salim, and other victims. Their bodies were posed naked with ropes around their necks. Sometimes they'd be wearing fur coats or hats. Bruce would shave their heads and beards and keep their hair as trophies in Ziploc bags. Police ordered 24-7 surveillance on Bruce with strict orders not to engage unless you see him alone with anyone. They sprung into action on January 18, 2018 when they saw John go into his apartment. They likely saved a man's life that day and finally ended Bruce's violent killing spree. But there was still one problem. Where were the bodies? Police suspected that Bruce used his landscaping business to hide his crimes all over the city. They searched five properties that Bruce worked on when his victims went missing. Four in Toronto and a nine-acre spread about 120 miles northeast. Most of the search centered on a home in Toronto's Leaside neighborhood. The owners were barred from their property while cadaver dogs scoured the land. They showed a strong interest in some large planter boxes. Unfortunately, it was mid-January and those boxes had frozen to the ground, so police thawed them with heaters and shipped all 12 to the coroner's office. Inside, the coroner found the dismembered skeletal remains of three people. It was enough to charge Bruce with three counts of first-degree murder in the deaths of Hamid Kahan, Sarush Mamoudi, and Dean Lisowick, a homeless man whose disappearance was never reported. By February, police found three more sets of remains in the planters from Leaside. Fingerprints confirmed one of the bodies was Andrew Kinsman. Leaside became ground zero. The owners had no idea they were living in a graveyard admiring the flowers that grew from decomposing bodies. Bruce was eventually charged with eight counts of first-degree murder between Project Houston and Project Prism. But his spree wasn't the first time multiple gay men went missing in Toronto. In the mid-1970s, 14 men from the gay community turned up dead. Half were solved, half went cold. Many shared similarities, leading people to believe they were connected. Bruce was in his 20s and working in Toronto at the time. According to experts, most serial killers begin killing around this time. It's rare for someone to start late. Bruce was 59 when he allegedly killed his first victim. Police are looking into a connection but so far they haven't been able to tie Bruce to the 1970s slayings. On February 8th, 2019, Bruce was sentenced to life in prison after pleading guilty to eight counts of first-degree murder. The judge called him pure evil and believed he would have happily kept killing had the police not caught him. Bruce can apply for parole when he's 91, though he'd be lucky to get it. He'll most likely die in prison. He is considered the most prolific murderer in Toronto and Canada's oldest known serial killer. He targeted men who, much like himself, had to hide who they were from their families. Then he buried them with a smile while some innocent couple watched him do their landscaping, all the while describing him as jolly, cheerful, and kind, just like Santa Claus. We've said it before and we'll say it again. You just never know the people around you. Happy holidays, folks. And that's your recap. Thanks for hanging out with us today. If you like getting all the crime in half the time, go ahead and tap that subscribe button and the bell so you never miss a story. We're here Wednesdays, Saturdays, and Sundays, but don't go away. Catch up on more recaps right here, right now. Until next time, take care.